China is not a compromise, so you can get everything fast or impossible. <laughs> Welcome to Mosaic of China, a podcast about people who are making their mark in China. I'm your host Oscar Fuchs. We all know the old stories about fake goods in China, but the parallel worlds of intellectual property infringement and anti-counterfeit regulation have changed a lot over the last decade. In today's episode, I talk with the lawyer Vittorio Franzese to reminisce about what it was like when this cat and mouse game was at its peak. Who were the counterfeiters? What actions could the lawyers take against them? How did the high-profile police raids come about? And what part did the big e-commerce platforms play in all of this? And why the hell am I asking myself so many questions? If that wasn't enough, to top it all off, not only do we talk about law courts, we also end up talking about tennis courts. Perfettissimo. I am here with Vittorio Francese. Is that how you say it? I'm uh, I'm amazed by your pronunciation, Oscar. <laughs> and you like to go by Vito, right? So I'll call you Vito today. Yeah, Vito. Vito is perfect. Uh, thank you, by the way, Oscar, a lot for inviting me. My pleasure. And I should also mention, if you do hear some background noise, this is to the listeners. It's because I've invited Vito to my house today. We had an issue with the studio, so I hope the sound quality will be okay. So, Vito, what is it that you do here in China? So, I'm here in China working as a lawyer. I I practice foreign law in an um, international law firm with an Italian background.、Um, I'm in China since、uh, it's been seven years already. I'm doing that. And before we go any further, tell me what is the object that you have brought, which in some way describes what you do. Okay,、um, I brought two objects with me. I actually couldn't choose. One is、uh, is actually some food.、Um, okay, well let me have a look because if it's food, I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think yeah, I hope it won't make too much noise. No, This is a typical snack、uh, from the south of Italy, and it's my. Real comfort food is something that people all around Italy make fun of us from my region. These、uh, kind of salty biscuits—they're called taralli. Taralli. Okay. So wait a minute. Let's do this now. Right. Here we go. Oh yeah. What's the herb in that?、Uh, it's actually fennel. It's just a seed of the fennel.、Uh, it's fennel. Right. Okay. I don't normally like fennel, but that is lovely. Okay. My actually grandma and my mom were always, always putting in all my suitcases when I was leaving to somewhere. When I was going to the university, it's supposed to save your life because you can maybe find yourself in a place where you don't have any food that you like to eat, and this will be something that can replace a, a meal.、Uh, one of those can replace a half a dish of pasta. It is pretty dense. It's not exactly a diet food. It's not recommended in any any diet, but、uh, <laughs> especially when you're eight thousand kilometers far from home,、uh, you feel better when you eat one of these. And they're called what again? Taralli is the plural. One is tarallo. Tarallo. Yes. And you're from the south of Italy, in that case. I am from Puglia, which is the region、uh, extreme southeast of Italy,、uh, the heel of Italy's boot. Yes, I think all of us can picture that. That's the funny thing about Italy; it has the most easy to understand shape. <laughs> Well, you said that you couldn't decide between two objects. So, what is your second object? It's here, and it's a pen. Okay. So they say that、uh, every lawyer should have a pen in his pocket, and this is what I carry with me all the time. It was donated to me by、um, my dad's law partner. I come from a family of lawyers, so this guy that I always considered my family. He kind of believed in my dad when my dad just graduated and he hired him in his firm. They became partners, and he was the first one that was really, really happy when I decided to come to China. I made this choice. I should have taken over my dad's firm. When I when I made this decision, it was kind of、uh, controversial for my mom, for my family, for some friends.、Uh, but this guy was always seeing it as a positive decision, as、uh, something that would have changed my life. And I mean, I like to think that he was right. It's interesting because the pair of those objects do encapsulate your identity to me. You know, I actually have known you now for a couple of years, and when I think of you, I think of a lawyer and a South Italian. So maybe I have to keep both of those objects in, although I'm breaking my own rules here. Hmm.、Uh, but that's excellent. And I did not know actually that your father was also a lawyer. So it was always destined that you would be a lawyer. 
he wasn't. I tried to, since I was little, to, you know, take the distances from what my father was doing. He was working a lot. I, I would see him working every day, uh, waking up very early in the morning. It wasn't really my type of life that I would see for, for my future. So I kind of tried my own way and I wanted to be a journalist. But then since we don't have a, a serious journalism faculty, a university, they take law and then they, they do some journalism courses and stuff. So, okay, well, whatever, let's take law. And then, <laughs> of course, at the end of the study, I, I realized that was kind of my inclination, kind of, I was defending my, my rights in so many situations throughout my life that I thought, okay, I could do this for, for other people. Let's move on then to your life in China. So how did that start? Did you come straight away to Shanghai? Uh, no, I didn't come straight to Shanghai. My first place where I've been living in China is Beijing. I've been living there for my first three years in China. I was working in an American firm doing an anti-counterfeiting law, a funny thing to do in China. Right. Interesting. And anti-counterfeit was a big subject five, ten years ago, especially, right? Yes, absolutely. I arrived and you see from abroad, you never know what happens within China borders. Uh, how do the big brands uh, protect, uh, enforce their intellectual property rights when uh, in China, uh, ancient China, coping was considered some a way to appreciate someone else's work. You copy and you let the author of the work know that you copied him. For example? For example, um, some script or some uh, paintings that were particularly liked by the people and everyone was thinking of the best way to copy it, the most faithful way to copy it. Right, I see. Out of respect for the original artist. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, it's remaking exactly in the same way uh, and it's something that should flatter the author. Right, especially when it comes to calligraphy, you know, there would be a calligraphy master and then he would have his own particular style and then other people would emulate that style, right? Yes, yes. And you try to reproduce this as many times as necessary to make it the perfect copy. Okay. Well, that's a convenient excuse for copying, isn't it? I mean, I guess that's a nice story. But then what did you encounter when you first came in into modern Beijing? Like, what was the situation? I found a lot of brands struggling uh, with no really uh, clue of what to do, of how to protect their products, their goods, the designs of their stuff that they were introducing into the Chinese market. Uh, so many of them were just throwing money at some uh, agents or investigators, which was supposed to help them uh, finding out what the sources of the goods was, but without really a strategy. That's something that I found in my uh, anti-counterfeiting team back in Beijing that my boss had a clear strategy of several steps to follow to get to the big fish, the one that was producing the goods. And who are these big fish? Who were the counterfeiters? I can say that most of the time uh, it was the factory itself that ended up being discovered as the producer of the fake goods. Uh, what was happening is that the director of the factory would keep it open at night exactly the same reproduction of, of what was produced uh, with the daylight. Those goods were going in other stocks that were addressed to the fake markets, to online stores on Taobao, before the crackdown on, on counterfeit goods on Taobao. Interesting. And then it doesn't really fit into what you said before about copying, because it's not copying, it's the exact same goods, right? <laughs> They found an easier way to copy. Just, <laughs> just let's let's make the same thing because the the foreign company decided to produce here. I see. Right. So that would have been an evolution because before they would have seen goods come in from the West, they would have tried to copy it with limitations in quality, plenty of defects. But as soon as they started to come here, then they could really ramp up the copying. They had a clear path to what was their final aim, which is producing the same type of products for a cheaper price and for the mass, let's say. Yeah, there's something which is actually worthy in that aim because they were trying to bring more of these goods to the masses. So I can almost see the virtue of what they were trying to do. But of course, they were doing it in a way which your clients would not have been happy about. <laughs> so what were the steps that you would take? Of course, we, we would start from the, the shop, uh, the online shop. So we would do uh, sample purchases and we would start a, a real cooperation with the seller, first of all. It would take money because you would need to buy several of these goods. 
to put you directly in contact with the manufacturer after a long process of knowing each other. The seller had to trust you as a person genuinely interested in big stocks of these products. Okay, so you take consignment of these goods, you understand that they are fake. What's the next step? So and here comes the funny part. You start a negotiation with uh, some authority. It's supposed to be the administrative authority, so AIC, the Administration of Industry and Commerce. This authority would decide if that case was important enough to be enforced. So they would go there to the, the factory. Everything would be prepared by our team, by our investigators. Uh, they would be only required to go there and raid the factory. So uh, make an immediate comparison with the real goods and decide that everything should have been seized in that very moment. Okay. And then when you said that you had to convince and negotiate with the regulators, what is it that they're looking for? So even if you had evidence, there would be times where they said, nah, we're, we're not going to make a raid. They needed to have a, an important case, a case that would have made the difference. Uh, they were aiming at numbers. Uh, what they wanted is, uh, is big cases that could have a reputational consequence for the, the authority of that area. Now the situation in China changed a lot, but I cannot deny that it was difficult to imagine that a public officer or a judge would uh, make a decision that would be against the Chinese side because of the empathy that you can feel for a person from your area against a foreign company. China has been uh, kind of closed to the foreigners for a long time, so it's easy to imagine that th this situation plus low salaries for the public officers would translate into more China side oriented. I mean, as you're explaining, I can totally see that. I mean, there's a judge in a situation where he is surrounded by people who he lives with. And then this Italian firm comes along and tries to say, no, you have to judge against your townsfolk and for this faraway company, which even if you're close to it, that company is faceless. You know, you don't even imagine the human beings behind that company. So I can see why at the beginning, at least, it would have been like that. But of course, as you say, we're talking about now seven, eight years ago. And I'm imagining that things have changed in that short period of time. Beijing and Shanghai were, since the beginning, something like uncorruptible. Um, and this trend has been followed in the past years by other cities. I believe they don't want to discourage the business there that can come from abroad. So they are more and more issuing uh, decisions that can uh, be considered uh, fair. Right. And I'm also assuming that the law has itself become more professionalized in these rural areas too, right? Because I'm guessing a lot of these judges in the past would have just been party officials who didn't have a background in law. Yes, yes. Education is doing a lot. And the pressure from the government is also having its effect. There's a precise policy now that has been followed in the past years and it has been implemented by the local judges, the local authorities and by the e-commerce platforms that before were part of the problem and that now are more and more themselves the enforcers of these policies. Right, you said e-commerce and that's interesting because in my mind when I think about counterfeit I think about just the local market with somebody who has put a few things on a blanket and tries to sell it. But what was the interface between counterfeiting and e-commerce? So um, 80% or 90% of fake goods were sold on e-commerce platforms. So that, that was representing already uh, big, big revenue of which the foreign brands would be deprived. But what happened is that the big platforms like Alibaba or like uh, Tmall, JD or uh, YHD, they were realizing less and less trust of the brands in general, also the Chinese big brands. And they decided to take a step to start controlling themselves, the goods, starting to filter what was sold on those channels, on those pages. In that case, how would they have made the distinction between real goods and a counterfeit good, especially in the case where, let's say, it's a factory that produces the same goods overnight? They were starting asking more about certificates. If the distributor is an authorized distributor, if they have directly 
relationships with the brand or what's the chain of sale. They were starting to get to the, the source of these goods. So where did you purchase them? Why do they have that price? Got it. So in that way, you can easily distinguish the true goods from the fake ones. Does that mean then that nowadays you can't find fake goods online? Well, the situation has absolutely improved in the past years. I don't want to say that the problem is solved. Uh, there are still specific platforms uh, for specific products. There's fake wines still being sold all over the web. Uh, but compared to 10 years ago, we are getting almost clean by, by counterfeit goods. But I always, always suggest my clients to register their trademark in China, even they are not present in China, even they have no intention to penetrate Chinese markets. They still are taking a chance to become so famous that someone is trying to steal their trademark in China to register in China. There's a prior to file principle in China, so not prior to use. So no right is granted to the use of a trademark. So somebody in China can register and can start producing legally. Wow, which I guess some companies have found out to their surprise. <laughs> There's so many cases, uh, for example, concerning the, the Chinese trademarks, so the Chinese transliterations of the trademarks. Uh, Hermes found out too late that I must show their Chinese transliteration had already been registered in China. It was the same for New Balance or for uh, Viagra or for Jordan. They all realized too late that the way Chinese recognize them by their Chinese name, if, they, if somebody registers that, then a lot of rights are not enforceable anymore for foreign brands in China. But so many fashion small manufacturers that didn't plan to get so successful found themselves uh, copied and with a Chinese name they didn't know about. Well, as fascinating as this is, I know that I'm doing a disservice to you because actually you don't do this anymore. So you've moved from Beijing to Shanghai and this is now a whole different world to what you're doing today. Yes, yes, I, I kind of switched. Uh, I still deal with uh, intellectual properties. My, uh, one of the, uh, the uh, areas of expertise I, I practice with, with most pleasure in China especially, but I practice uh, international transactions, cross-border transactions, commercial agreements. Uh, this is what I do nowadays in Shanghai. This is, in my mind, more of the sort of typical cross-border international commercial lawyer. I went back to be a boring lawyer. <laughs> no, you're not boring, Vittorio. Like, what projects do you have rumbling along now? Well, I enjoy being a lawyer. I enjoy my profession. But I also, you know, see myself after a few years getting out of those uh, boundaries, uh, getting out of the profession itself. This is what I, I'm actually already starting to try out with a few friends. We got super addicted to a particular sport, a racket sport called the paddle tennis. Paddle tennis. It's called like that in uh, Spanish. It was born in the uh, 70s. And uh, the name comes from uh, the particular shape of a racket. It looks like a pan. And you play a kind of tennis, uh, two against two, but the court is a bit smaller and it's surrounded by glass panels. So you can use the glass panels however you want in the game. Which is like squash, I guess? It's very similar to squash. I would say it's uh, in the middle between squash and tennis. But it's uh, more fun because you share the, the social aspect of the team, of being in a team of two people and of uh, running from one side to the other of the court uh, in complete harmony with the other player, with your teammate. So you can get to never-ending points, to incredible rallies and, uh, and marathons, and it's really, really fun. Uh, we created a small community that now grew up uh, up to 100 people. They're weekly playing this sport, and uh, all of them got super, super addicted to it, and they want to play more. We invented this ranking system. I invite you to, to try it out. Okay, so where is this court? So somebody built a court? 
Yes, the, the, the court was built already by a Swedish company. Uh, they just wanted to try the parallel market in China. So they found this space in uh, Yampu district. Uh, what I would like to do is also to build our own courts with my partners. They're also, of course, my friends and the people I play parallel usually with. And we are actually at the moment very close to signing a deal. Uh, I will tell you the details later when it happens. And it's going to be even more an addiction. All right, I am going to look up paddle tennis. I've never heard of it. But this is partly what I think Shanghai does to people because the people here are so commercial. Everyone is an entrepreneur. Even if you're a lawyer, you have a side gig. <laughs> I'm almost not surprised that you have something like this in your back pocket. Yeah, we, we all become uh, kind of sales of ourselves uh, in some way. So uh, the opportunity and the chance is literally around the corner. I, I see a city that is still growing a lot, economically speaking, and there's, there's still opportunities for everyone. It's uh, potentially more capitalistic than any other country I've been living in. <laughs> so, um, yeah, why not giving it a try? Well, I'm looking at one of your objects, this half-eaten breadstick. I'm thinking... If I eat too many of these, I'll definitely need to do more paddle tennis. So maybe I will be your first customer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vito. Thank you, Oscar. Thanks again. Well, let's move on to part two. Okay, the 10 questions. Are you ready? I am very ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question one. What is your favorite China-related fact? So I was in a compound in Beijing and I realized that in that compound there must have been more people than in my hometown related to the amount of people that can be in a compound or a, a district of a big city like Beijing or Shanghai. My hometown is called Trani. It's on the uh, east coast of Puglia. So it's a very nice old town with a cathedral on the sea, but no more than 50,000 people. Uh, so kind of hard for me to imagine the amount of people I would have faced here. <laughs> 50,000. And what was the compound you lived in in Beijing? It was obviously a, a big high-rise building. It was a compound made by uh, probably uh, 8 to 10 buildings of 42 floors each. <laughs> and then going back to Trani then, that would have been a place where you would know everyone in that town and they would know you and they would know your business. We all know each other, yes, and they would know not only your business, they would know what you've done uh, the night before because they probably <laughs> have seen you. <laughs> there is some comfort in the anonymity of living in big cities, right? <laughs> Do you have a favorite word or phrase in Chinese? Uh, relating to my, my personal experience, I would say uh, meng, the Chinese dream. Right, meng, yes, the Chinese dream. As I was saying, this is a country that I found out can be country of the opportunities where to grow your dream and this is exactly what happened in the first four years um, I realized that I was uh, uh, that I was growing very fast and I was already when I imagined I would have been in uh, 10 or 12 years yeah you're right it is funny how somehow when you step into China you basically are on this fast track to something completely new okay next question what is your favorite destination within China I was uh, stunned by uh, Yunnan's mountains. Um, I found places where you can access only with the Jeep that is driven by a local guy that can bring you up in the mountain. And that was uh, pretty amazing. You arrive to a small village and it's just a little mountain village as you imagine in your dreams. I felt for the first time uh, that traveling in China wasn't something too mainstream. I felt like you still can get to isolated place up on a mountain. Amazing. Okay. Well, I've been to Yunnan. It was always my dream. But now you're making me think that I have to go back immediately. <laughs> if you left China, what would you miss the most and what would you miss the least? It's something that uh, I've always thought about China. Uh, by living here, you realize how easy is the life. Uh, sometimes you have a problem and it gets solved just by knowing someone that has dealt with it before. Suddenly, it's not anymore a problem. I feel like I do a lot of things in one day, uh, something I wouldn't be able to do uh, back home uh, where where life is so so chill and and you need to take your time for e every single thing you you want to complete um, on the other side it's that something that could look super straight and super easy to get would become 
impossible just for reasons that are unknown to you because you have to pass through some uh, authorization or procedure that suddenly uh, becomes slow and you cannot explain why, but, but you, just, you just find yourself in front of a problem that you didn't expect to encounter. China is not a compromise, so you can get everything fast or impossible. <laughs> well said. Is there anything that still surprises you about life in China? Uh, absolutely, yes. I still get surprised every day. Um, I was cycling to work uh, in Beijing, and on this big, big road, uh, I was seeing a huge Porsche. Uh, they were pulling over, and the, the mom was, was getting off with the kid that was just uh, peeing over the street like no one is, is seeing us. These people, super wealthy, they're still being... Uh, just practical. Yes, yes. <laughs> I might drive a huge Porsche, but I'm going to help my kid piss out of the door. <laughs> what about your favorite place to eat, to drink, or to hang out? Okay. In Shanghai, I, I have a few places. I can mention uh, Portomatto for comfort food, Italian restaurant from the south of Italy in, on Chanshulu. It's a place where I go when I, when I really want to feel home, and I, and I manage to do that. It's, uh, it's a food I've been growing with. And then I can also mention uh, Casa Mia for the, the quality of food. And I have to say that I do really love W Hotel for their Sunday brunch. Uh, I do like that vibe. Nice. What is the best or worst purchase you've made in China? I have to say I'm really, really attached to my first bicycle I bought in Beijing. It's a proper Hutong bike uh, with uh, huge wheels. I bought it on Smart Beijing from someone that was uh, leaving Beijing after maybe 20 years. Uh, it was kind of a rare example of a Hutong bike that people could use back in the 70s or the 80s. So I really kept it with care. And I was moving around the streets of Beijing thanks to this transportation that I gave to my best friend once I left Beijing. It's still there. I still use it when I go there for business trip. Okay. Well, I need to have a photo of that. <laughs> What is your favorite WeChat sticker? <laughs> okay, so uh, this is the 100 quiet note. Someone folded it down. Uh, it looks like Mao is super sad. But then uh, suddenly you change the perspective and you see Mao assuming a happy face and then also a mean face in the very end. <laughs> nice. Next question. What's your go-to song to sing at KTV? I think that I have to talk about my favorite Chinese song that I like to sing at KTV. It's called uh, Woman Bu Yang. Uh, it's a very popular song from Da Zhuang. I don't know the author well except for this song, but I really like to sing it, especially when there's the refrain part. Uh, it reaches uh, some high tones. Uh, I love to try to, to get them well, though it doesn't really happen often. <laughs> yeah, but if you're drunk, you don't care, right? <laughs> the other people care, though. They still notice it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to steal that one. And finally, what other China-related media or sources of information do you rely on? So I, I know what's happening uh, because I read maybe the, the first page of a, of a Chinese newspaper and I analyze the, the point of view of the Chinese press. I've been watching CGTN sometimes. I read China Wire and China Insights. Very good. Well, thank you, Vito. That was a real pleasure. I enjoyed getting to know more about your background, things that I didn't actually know myself. <laughs> thank you so much for the great chance. And before you go, out of everyone you know in China, who do you recommend that I interview for the next season of Mosaic of China? Tarika Cortel. Uh, she knows uh, this country as no one else, I would say. And she has a very, very peculiar point of view on what happens here, also related to her Tahitian uh, island uh, background. So it will be really interesting uh, for you to hear her, her point of view. Well, thank you. I'm glad that you said it was Tarika, <laughs> because actually I know you through Tarika and... Yeah, she is from Tahiti, and I think that alone makes her interesting enough to talk about. But yeah, her experiences in China should make for a great episode. Thank you so much, Vito. Thank you again, Oscar. Thanks. So, Vito has indeed opened a paddle tennis court in central Shanghai, and it now has over 300 members. And if that wasn't enough, it happens to be the highest paddle court in the world. 
It's called Sino Paddle and it's at the Shanghai International Fashion Education Center or CFEC on Changshou Lu. I've posted a very short video of it online, so please check it out at all the usual places. And apart from that, you can also see other fun stuff, such as Vito eating a bag full of taralli, he and his colleagues sitting on some seized counterfeit toy cars, he and friends posing like Da Vinci's The Last Supper at one of the favorite restaurants he mentioned, him looking very relaxed in his hometown of Trani, and my personal favorite, he and his best purchase in China, the Hutong bike. As always, I'm going to remind you of the premium version of the show, where you can hear the full version of my conversation with Vito. You can now subscribe with the click of a button on Apple Podcasts. Just search for Mosaic of China Premium there, or head to Patreon or iFadian. Here are some clips of what you can hear there today. This is not what I picture a legal team to be doing. Indeed, there was not much of uh, purely legal in this type of procedure. These people, they would be kind of... Uh, not criminal, but working in this grey area. Yes. This is a kind of task that needs a lot of cold blood. Uh, so not always easy to arrive to that moment. You make the law, you find the trick. The tricksters are always one step ahead, right? <laughs> And also, there were some really nice connections with previous guests from the podcast. Just by chance, one of these was in the catch-up with the Instagram influencer Michael Z at the end of last week's episode with Crystal Mo. While Vito came to China from Italy, Michael has just moved to Italy from China, and he was predicting some of the same things that Vito mentioned about the different pace of life. The biggest overlap was with Vladimir Jurovic from episode 13 of season 2. While Vito talked about the legal process of registering trademarks in China, Vladimir talked about the creative process of coming up with these Chinese names in the first place. But perhaps the nicest connection came from the fact that Vito and I recorded this episode in my house. Because at one point, maybe you heard the ringing of a bell just outside the window. This was the sound of a tricycle peddler collecting recycled goods from the lane outside my apartment. And it was exactly this sound that was picked by Stéphane Ouimet, the chief consumer officer of L'Oréal in China from all the way back in episode one of season two, as the thing he would miss the most if he left China. Mosaic of China is me, Oscar Fuchs, with artwork by Denny Newell. Coming up is a catch up with the literary translator Gigi Cheng from season one, episode 24. Heads up, there was a bug in the software that we used to record it, but luckily it only affected the recording a few times and it only seemed to affect my side of the conversation. Hello. Hey. Hello Oscar, how are you? I'm well, uh, but all the better to see you now that it's been so long. And I say that because actually you left Shanghai quite soon after we did our recording. Where am I talking to you from now? Yeah, I'm now in Shenzhen, so I think we must have recorded about two years ago. Yes, it was. And how is Shenzhen? It's great. It's um, busy and happening. And because it's much warmer here, a lot of the restaurants have outdoor seating. Right. So, so it always feels sort of buzzing. But otherwise, like life as a translator, I guess would be more or less the same wherever you are. It's just you and your clipboard. <laughs> yes, and my computer, my like my desk, my whole setup, and it, it doesn't really change. You know, <laughs> I work from home anyway, and I don't have that much social interaction before. <laughs> Well, last time we talked, we were talking about your work translating, of course, The Legend of the Condor Heroes by mm -hmm. Jin Yong. When we talked, I think the second volume of the novel, which was the first book that I translated for the series, has just come out. I was starting to co-translate um, volume three with the translator of volume one, Anna Homewood. And then since then, I have finished translating the rest of the novel, which is volume four, with Shelley Bayan, who used to live in Shanghai, but right now I think she is in Singapore. Okay, so now you have co-translated three out of the four volumes, which is yes. now the whole book finished. Yes, yes, indeed, yes. 
you have now been imbued in this world of kung fu for two, three years. So uh, six what does years. it mean? <laughs> six already. How does it feel now to be done with the whole book? Like, do you feel like a relief or do you miss it? It's really exciting. I won't say I miss it because I've already started the next one. The oh, next so it's part. not finished. No, oh, no, God. no. It's a trilogy. So we've only finished the first novel of the trilogy. The first novel is four volumes and I'm now starting the next novel, which is also another four volumes. My God, this is going to be your entire life's work. <laughs> yes, it's, it's going to be the next few years at least, hopefully. Did you ever imagine you'd be spending six years already and then a further God knows how many doing this one book? Um, no, I haven't sort of thought of it or planned it to happen this way. It just sort of snowballed by itself. It's As a freelancer, it's very, very nice to know that you have work lined up. At the same time, it's also very stressful to know that you've got work lined up because it means you may have to say no to a lot of other opportunities mm. when, when they arise. Any You've freelancer already committed would yourself. Know, mm. Yes, yes. Any freelancer would know work comes like buses. They either come in batches or they don't. I guess it's nice to be able to really immerse into these worlds because I read them in my early teens and watch the TV dramas back then. And it, it's really nice to rediscover them. Yeah, that is nice. And you've done other podcasts since doing mine. I feel like I've launched your career as a podcast guest. Yes. Culture Potato. This is the project that your friend Sammy Liu is working on, right? Uh, her, her husband, um, Yifan. And they've actually got a bookshop now in London. Well, this is actually it, because after you referred Sammy... She and her husband moved to London. And of course, yeah. I think the plan was to have a, a lifestyle that was going to be half London, half Beijing. Yeah. But it turned out to be 100% London. Lot of, lot of London. Yeah. Yes. So actually, that's the reason why in the end, even though she was a great referral, we couldn't really include her in the second <laughs> season of Mosaic of China, sadly. Yeah, wait until they come back. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can get them back for a, a future season. Uh, but yeah, I'm yeah. sorry about that. But um, I did find a good replacement. So I will put out your update chat that we're doing now alongside the person who I found as a replacement. Okay, okay, great, great. Yeah. Well, there has been one sad update since you left. And that I saw on a post that you did. It was about one of your pets, which you counted as your best purchase that you made in China. Dora, yes. She passed away last year. She had a lot of health issues. She's got no teeth. She could barely see. She can't hear very well. And, and so in the end, it just got old and passed away. But she didn't suffer too much, so it was okay. <laughs> yeah, and... Yeah. I was really sad when I saw you and your husband post about that. But at the same time, it was so amazing to see what life you gave her, you know, the extra two years that yes, she was able to yeah. spend with you because, you know, she was already given up for dead when you adopted her in the yes. first place. Yes, yes. So it was um, a blessing and it was really nice to have her. We still got one dog and one cat, so it's not like the household is empty. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And are there any plans to replenish the menagerie with some local Shenzhen pets? Uh, probably not for the time being, no. <laughs> yeah. Until you see another photo online and then you're forced to. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, we're coming up to the end of our time. Thank you so much, yep. Gigi. It was great to have you on the original show and great to see you again now. I, yeah. I have a special place in my heart for people like you who work with words I just love the stuff that you do when you are sort of swimming around those two cultures and trying to find the little bridges that link the two. I just love that stuff. Thank you so much, Gigi. Yeah, okay. Thank you.